Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those venturing into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. I wanted to mention that we'll be recording this podcast live on April 8th. Get your tickets at loopedlive.com. L-O-O-P-E-D-L-I-V-E dot com. We'll be telling some super spooky new stories we've been working on, and you can also join me for a meet and greet after the show. I really hope you will join me. And also special guest Edwin Covarubius from the Scary Story Podcast for a great evening. It's obvious why people are afraid of things like spirits, ghosts, and goblins. It's the fear of the unknown. That's why we feel more comfortable around other human beings who live in our dimension. But when the unusual, or even the evil, masquerade as human beings, that is when we are really in danger. Because we don't even know we should be afraid. First, the outsider is already home. Followed by the dark side of superpowers. Then, friends till the deadly end. Finally, in our featured story, screaming for help, but no one can hear. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week. And of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. So, want to hear something scary? Fear of the unknown. You can pretend everything is okay, but that will only get you so far before you can't ignore the danger knocking on your door. Like in this story, inspired by Floyd. Tiana and Shiloh had been roommates for almost a year. They started off as a good match because they kept to themselves. Tiana was a coder and spent long days in front of her computer in peace and quiet. Being an introvert, she didn't mind being left alone in her space with her thoughts. Shiloh would spend most of her time in her room. It went on like this for a while until little things began to bother Tiana. Tiana was constantly annoyed by finding dirty cups in the sink, odd-smelling soap spilt on the bathroom counter, and a green nightlight that shined all day and night from underneath Shiloh's bedroom door. These little things began to gnaw at Tiana. Instead of saying anything, she just let it fester. Until one night, Tiana slipped and fell in the bathroom. The floor was covered in a slime-like substance. It must have been Shiloh's gross soap. Tiana was fuming when she went to bang on Shiloh's bedroom door. No answer. She flung open the door and was shocked by what she saw. No one was in the room, but the whole place glowed green. The walls were filled with photos of supposed UFO sightings printouts of published conspiracy theories, and jar after jar of that nasty-smelling soap. She closed the door quickly as she heard Shiloh coming into the house. Tiana didn't know what to make of what she saw, but she didn't have time to think about it now. She had a long day ahead of her at work. She got into the zone, working on a module, but she couldn't shake the feeling that now... She was being watched. After what must have been hours, Tiana gave her eyes a rest and a much-needed break. Heading to the kitchen to grab a snack, she saw that Shiloh had left something out on the counter again. Tiana examined it closer. It was a silver rectangle with unusual carvings on it. It looked like a photo she had noticed hanging in Shiloh's bedroom. Tiana took a step closer. The whole box lit up green, the same hue from the nightlight she hated. She knew she should mind her own business and leave whatever it was alone. But she stepped closer, and the light 
seemed to glow brighter, almost as if it wanted her attention. Tiana couldn't resist. She had to pick it up and examine it. However, as soon as her fingers closed around it, she froze in place. She couldn't blink or scream, let alone breathe. Shiloh's bedroom door slowly began to creak open behind her. Three people walked out, all in white suits and sunglasses, going directly to Tiana. One spoke, and Tiana knew the voice immediately. It was Shiloh. I didn't want it to be this way, but I know you saw everything in my room. Shiloh reached into her pocket and withdrew a syringe. Tiana felt the needle being shoved into her shoulder. Her head swam, her eyelids drooped, and finally, her joints slackened as the box fell from her fingers, making a hollow thud as it hit the wooden floorboards. Tiana followed seconds after, slumped on the floor. Tiana noticed that sticky, stinky soap pooling on the floor around her. She looked up as she saw it had leaked from the feet of Shiloh and her accomplices. This was the last thing she saw before she passed out. When Tiana woke up, she was strapped down, trapped in a solid tube of glass. She peered through and saw Shiloh grinning back at her. She's awake and lucid, Shiloh proclaimed. We can prep her for surgery. Tiana tried to blink the tiredness away. She mustered all of her energy to demand they tell her what was going on. I was going to spare you. You were a suitable housemate, helpful in maintaining my cover. But you had to get nosy, Shiloh explained. Now you will join the rest of our human subjects. Tiana didn't understand. They were all human. What was Shiloh talking about? That's when Shiloh grabbed a fistful of her brittle brown hair and pulled off her wig and her human skin. Underneath was the flat face of a lizard with beady black eyes, green and yellow scaly skin, and needle-pointed teeth. Then she hissed with her forked tongue. Don't worry. Soon, you'll be one of us. Thank you so much, Floyd, for inspiring this extraterrestrial tale for us. We don't normally go into our alien forces and alien beings, and I'm glad that we could do it this time. How about you, listener? Do you believe in extraterrestrials here on Earth? Have you ever suspected anyone of being an alien? What would you do if you did? Each of us has the capacity for good and evil. The moment good does not prevail, there's no telling what will happen next. Like in this story inspired by Nate. For as long as Nathan could remember, he had been bullied. He was always told that if ignored, his bullies would eventually lose interest, but things only got worse. One day during a particularly brutal beating, Nathan raggedly, continuously called out for help to someone, something, anything. His hysterical begging was soon answered. And Nathan found a dark, angry strength inside himself. After that day, he was never bullied by those kids again. Nathan was no longer like other kids his age. He had heightened senses now in addition to his enhanced strength. He could hear frequencies no one else could, like the high-pitched hum from the refrigerator. He was always the first to know if the trash had to go out because he could smell it all the way from his bedroom. But he would also talk in his sleep. Nothing coherent, but weird enough that his big brother Jackson noticed. At first, Nathan didn't notice how different he'd become after that day with the bullies, but Jackson always made sure to point out how his brother was now a weirdo. 
it didn't bother Nathan because Jackson still always let him tag along and hang out. One night, Jackson and Nathan were walking home from the pizza place when some kids from another school approached them. Big kids. The ringleader was a senior for the third year in a row and a known troublemaker. He started throwing insults at the brothers, and Nathan suddenly felt that same dark anger rising inside himself. He felt his blood run cold as icy sweat dripped from his neck, and just when it looked like this bully was about to punch Jackson, Nathan jumped in. He knocked the bully to the ground and laid in punch after punch, pummeling him into the pavement. There was a dead stare in Nathan's eyes that terrified his brother. Finally, Jackson found the courage to pull Nathan off the bully before things hit a point of no return. When they got home, Jackson was speechless. He had never seen his brother in such a state. It was as if he had become someone else or something else. Nathan explained that it couldn't have been such a bad thing if whatever was happening was used to protect his brother. Jackson still had nothing to say, even as both of them went to bed. He tried to forget about what had happened earlier. Later that night, Nathan's eyes sprung open, but it felt as though he was looking through someone else's eyes, and it appeared as though he was standing. Nathan walked slowly toward his brother's bed. Jackson was sleeping, which Nathan was glad for because He didn't need his brother thinking he was a creep, too, for lurking over him. Nathan tried to go back to his bed before Jackson woke up and asked him what the heck he was doing, but Nathan's body wouldn't respond. He watched as his own hand reached out and placed itself on his brother's throat, as if trying to choke him. Nathan began to panic, but it was all on the inside as his guts twisted into knots. Jackson finally woke up with a start. Then, a deep, raspy voice that sounded like metal on metal said, I've given you power. Now it's time to collect payment. Jackson looked up at Nathan, his face all twisted in confusion and fright. He shoved Nathan hard, hoarsely yelling at him. What was he doing? To Nathan's surprise, he regained control of his body and caught himself from falling down from the panicked push. Panting, he asked Jackson if he had heard that, heard that voice. Jackson replied, Heard what? You're losing your mind, man. So the voice was only in his head then. Nathan hesitantly tried to explain what had happened, the powers he felt, the voice. Jackson listened intently, but was looking at him funny. Nathan could tell Jackson was thinking something, but wouldn't say it. He was just pretending everything was fine, nodding at him awkwardly. Nathan went to the bathroom, and when he looked in the mirror, he saw it. His once green eyes were pure black, his irises red. He heard the voice again. You still owe me payment. Thank you so much, Nate, for sending in and inspiring this story. How about you, listener? Have you ever felt superhuman strength? There have been real-life stories with mothers pulling cars off of children, being powered by something other than themselves, it seems. What would you do if you have superpowers? We're always be heroes in our own story. Would you be a hero? It's said that a true friend is there for you through thick and thin, by your side no matter what. So, choose your friends wisely, or they may be the death of you. Like in this story, inspired by Ishida. Matilda eagerly waited for the mail. She was expecting a letter from her daughter, Eleonora, and it was already several days late. 
Though her daughter was only 12, she lived far away from her mother who lived near Paris. After Eleonora's father died, she had been sent to a boarding school in the country. Being a widow and a mother had just been too much for Matilda to handle on her own at the time. Matilda received a letter from her daughter every Monday, and what she read recently started worrying her about Eleonora. It all started about two months ago when she was having a difficult time at the school. Eleonora had been late to change for gym class, and when she got into the locker room, she overheard her so-called friends gossiping about her. The discussion was led by Claudette, who made fun of Eleonora's joggers. Imani jumped in saying at least they covered up her unshaved legs. And Arabella mocked Eleonora's accent. They were ruthless and cruel. Eleonora slunk out of the locker room without making a peep, and when she made it to the schoolyard, she sobbed till she could no longer breathe. When her eyes dried and she caught her breath, she looked up to see a boy she had never seen before towering over her. He was raven-haired, and when she looked into his trustworthy eyes, a calm instantly came over her, He introduced himself as B, a nickname, he said, handed her a napkin and asked if she was okay. He told her that he would be her friend, a true friend, forever. When Matilda received a letter from Eleanor explaining the incident, she was heartbroken. She wasn't there to give instant motherly advice and to teach her how to deal with mean girls. Matilda wrote Eleonora back, telling her how much she loved her, and she was grateful that B showed up when he did. But after a few more letters, Matilda wasn't so sure. According to the letters, B and Eleonora really took a liking to each other. They became best friends. B told her, best friends will do anything for each other and spend all their time together, and so they did. Every free moment was spent exploring the rolling countryside surrounding the school and sharing secrets over picnics of cheeses and grapes, all the while laughing and fantasizing about ways to get back at Claudette and the others. It was all make-believe until, over time, terrible things began to happen. Claudette died from a spontaneous allergic reaction, her whole body in hives, twitching and gasping, apparently alone, on the grounds behind the school. Imani tripped and fell into thorny bushes, covering her body in a multitude of tiny cuts that, despite medicine, all became horribly infected. And Arabella bit off her own tongue when a ball hit her in the head during gym class. Matilda was very concerned with the strange happenings and for Eleonora's safety, so she was relieved when someone knocked on the door with that week's letter. She opened the door to see a raven-haired boy with big, trustworthy eyes. He handed her a letter that he said was from Eleonora. She reluctantly took it from the boy and opened it. She immediately knew something was off. The letter, typically written in blue ink, was now written in dark red. Tears welled up in her eyes as she held her breath and read, Dear Mom, by the time you read this letter, I'll already be gone. But don't worry, I'm in a better place, thanks to B. See, he hurt the mean girls for me, because friends do things for each other. In exchange, I did something for him. I gave him my soul. When Matilda finished the letter, the boy was gone. She called the police and they soon discovered that the letter wasn't written in ink. It was written in Eleanor's blood. No one at the school had ever heard of B. And like Eleanora, he was never found. Thank you so much, Ashita, for inspiring this very dark tale of best friends forever. Okay, listener, be honest. Have you had a friend who was a bad influence? How did they get you into trouble? 
Hopefully you recovered from it. Tell us your stories. Something scary at snarled.com. When you can see the danger and evil before anyone else, the natural instinct is to warn the ones you love and protect them. But what can you do if they won't listen? Special thanks to April Pratt for her input with this episode. Talented, empathic, autistic were all words that had been used to describe Phoebe. She was 17 years old and she didn't speak. She never had. This made communicating incredibly difficult, but now what she needed to share was too important to ignore. It started off a day like any other. She checked to be sure her shadow was still attached to her. It was, and so she got out of bed. Her mother helped her get dressed, but Phoebe struggled when it came time to put on her shoes. She didn't want to wear them today. Can't you just be good today? Her mother asked as she ignored Phoebe's protests. As her mother made breakfast for Phoebe and her siblings, Phoebe would pace back and forth through the hallway and into the living room, trying to gather her thoughts and quiet her mind. She always had a ringing in her ears that was sometimes unbearable. So the marching helped her snuff it out. She clocked her siblings running around the house playing, their shadows flickering behind them, waving at Phoebe as they ran by. Phoebe checked again for her own shadow, being sure it was still with her. She was always afraid it might take off on its own and never return. She knew she needed to keep her shadow and that everyone did because shadows are what make people human. Later that day, Phoebe's mother told her she had a visitor coming. Someone named Karina, who was going to spend the day with her while her mother ran errands with her siblings. Again, she asked Phoebe to be good. Phoebe knew that meant her mother wanted her to sit still, which was so frustrating. Her mother introduced her to the caregiver, Phoebe looked down at her feet, waiting for Karina's shadow to come out and introduce itself. Karina grabbed Phoebe by the chin and brought her face up to force eye contact. Karina was much taller and wider than her with pale pink skin. She smiled at Phoebe with an unpleasant smile that stretched too far across her wide face. Phoebe noticed there was nothing behind her eyes. She was empty. She paced around Karina, trying to find her shadow, but it didn't exist. Phoebe screamed and tried everything she could to let her family know there was something wrong with Karina. But her mother simply sighed and said, Please, Phoebe, just be good. Thanking Karina for hooking them up with the places that they were heading to that day, shutting the door behind her as her and the family left. Phoebe tried to avoid Karina all day. But the woman finally pushed Phoebe into the shower before bed. When she was in the shower, she peeked out through the curtain and could see Karina through the cracked open door. What Phoebe saw would haunt her for the rest of her days. She watched as Karina's skin deflated like a balloon, her flesh sagging off her bones as she unzipped it from under her arms to reveal not a shadow, but a living pile of bone and garbage, sludge dripping from in between her teeth as she smiled, that awful smile. The entity slowly began to make its way into the bathroom. Phoebe couldn't imagine what the creature was doing, but then it hit Phoebe, her shadow. It was going for what made her human. Phoebe looked at her shadow, waiting for her outside of the bathtub, Thinking quickly, she hopped out of the shower and hit the lights, cloaking her shadow in darkness. She looked back to Karina just in time to watch her zip her skin back over her bones before she asked Phoebe as sweetly as she could, Are you ready for bed? Phoebe hid under her covers, shaking. She finally took a breath when she heard her family walk back into the house. But when she saw them, her heart sank. Something had happened to them while they were away, away at the places Karina had recommended to them. Her family stood there with two wide smiles on their faces 
and as for their shadows, they were long gone. This week's podcast stories were edited by Markia McCarty, Sarah Lukasiewicz, and Dennis Culver. Narration by Markia McCarty. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Art and graphics by Mari Carlson. Produced by Hannah Mullen and Markia McCarty. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman. <laughs>